Yeah. That's what the bio says. So we're super excited to, to hear from Jeff. The stage is yours. Thank you for coming today to my talk. Uh, my talk is about end-to-end -end encryption of distributed applications. And as you said, my name is Jeff. I'm from California. And I run Jafinko Guru, which is a global internet consultant agency. We handle security and also marketing for our clients worldwide. And basically what my talk about today is um, that the need for applications to have encrypted messages is no longer a afterthought, it is a requirement. We live in an age where hackers are going to try and steal your data, uh, especially men in the middle attacks. WikiLeaks is constantly releasing information. And so what is end-to-end -end encryption? Basically, it is a method of communicating where only the users that are meant to read the messages are able to read the messages. You're encrypting something from point A, and it's only decrypted in point B. In the middle point, it is not able to be read. For instance, uh, this method is used by applications like WhatsApp and Signal to encrypt their messages. You're able to have conversations with your friends, with business colleagues, and no one is able to read this communication in between. And if done right, you actually need to have physical access to the device to even read these messages. There have been instances as well where ISPs are asked to provide communications from customers, and they're only able to provide data like this. So for instance, if this was a chat between two friends or two terrorists, you would not know what is actually going on. You simply receive this message, which is just garbled, and you're not able to decrypt it or tell what they were actually talking about. Now recently, WikiLeaks has released some information that the CIA has been developing malware to try and decrypt these kinds of messages. Now, even they are not able to decrypt the end-to-end -end encryption. They are only able to create a malware that sits on your phone or computer or television and actually use it for you. So for instance, these malwares are sitting on your phone and they're acting like the user itself, using the application and reading the messages before they happen. So as you're typing the message into WhatsApp or into Signal, they are then capturing this via a keylogger and then they're able to simply read the message before it's actually encrypted. And so how do we implement this? Uh, there are many ways that you can implement this, but there are also some very simple ways that we can implement this. But first, we want to make sure our system is as secure as possible. And we don't want to store our keys somewhere. Um, I've heard a few times that you can have security to be secure enough, but there is always a problem that for the initial security and initial encryption, you must have a key exchange. Now, what we want to actually do is create keys that cannot be stolen and are used only once. So as soon as you create the encryption, they are destroyed automatically and the encrypted message is sent. By the time the message is sent, the keys are already destroyed. That way, when someone asks you, give me your keys, you can simply say, what keys? I don't have the keys. And when encrypting our messages, it is also helpful if we don't even know our own password. Uh, the problem I see a lot of times in code is that the password is embedded into the code itself or is generated somehow in a way that can be found out. And so what we want to do is actually generate a one-time use password and then encrypt the message and send it on. Now, we also want to use the strongest encryption available. Not SHA-1. Yeah. Thank you, Google, for cracking that one. But there are other options available to us. We also want to sign our message. Now, this is very important because even though we're trying to prevent man-in-the-middle attacks, there can always be a case where someone is monitoring our traffic, figures out what we're doing, and then changes the message while it is in transit. 
By signing the message and embedding it into the message itself, we are able to make sure that this message has not been tampered with. And while someone is possibly monitoring our network, we also want to make sure that they're not able to figure out the structure of our messages. Now, this is very important because oftentimes what we see with encryption methods is they're becoming standardized. And I don't really like standardized encryption because even though everyone knows exactly how it works and what's going on, this is also a disadvantage of that kind of encryption. Because when you know, that, when you know how it works and you know how it's structured, then you can easily tell, for instance, what kind of encryption they're using and how from then you can decrypt it. So what we want to try and do is create a totally random structure in our messages once we encrypt them. So what options do we have? Uh, there are many options available to us, but I'm going to cover a couple now. Option one is JSON web tokens. Uh, this has become prevalent all over the internet and it's used for authentication. You can also send simply uh, messages or JSON data or any other type of data to point A to point B. And an example looks like this. So we simply import the module JWT and we give it a payload. So we see here some JSON data with the payload payload and password secret. We're using 256-bit encryption and the output looks like this. Now there are some benefits to this kind of encryption. One of it is our payload is extremely small. So it's not taking up very much data and we're able to transit this across the network without using very much resources. And we can also use different algorithms. In this example, I use 256-bit encryption, but you can also choose various other algorithms depending on what your needs are for that moment. Now the problem, though, with JSON Web Tokens that I have found during my experimentation is that there are too many constants, even when the payload and secret are different. One of the things I did is I took the code and I ran it five different times. I changed the payload and I also changed the password. Now, I didn't change it very much, but as you can see, in the bottom examples, this is all of the output here. Five different outputs is exactly the same. You also see the period as a separator. The middle is the actual message itself. And the last part of the structure of a JSON web token is the signature, which includes the header, the payload itself, and the entire message signed so that we know that it's not tampered with. Of the reason why everything is consistent in a JSON web token is because of the header. Now, the header contains what kind of algorithm you have used and also what kind of token it is, what kind of payload is inside of it. So these things will remain constant no matter how much of the data you actually change. And as you can see, it doesn't matter how many times you run it, if you're using the same algorithm and you're using the same payload, then there is always a period as a separator. At this point, are built, you will always know that someone is sending you a JSON web token because a period is involved. And this I see as a very big disadvantage. I believe in encryption, you should never know what kind of encryption someone is using. If I'm monitoring your web traffic, then I would know immediately that you are using JSON web tokens. And from there, I have the ability to try and decrypt what you are doing. And one of the other big problems is that the secret is actually embedded into the code itself. Now, with JSON Web Tokens, you have to choose a secret. Same with any other encryption method, mostly. You must give it a password in order for it to encrypt. Now, this secret can also be keys, RSA keys, but this is also a disadvantage because eventually these keys, you've either created them or it's embedded into your code like this. And from there, it's very easy for someone to try and figure out what you're doing, steal your passwords, and then decrypt your data. So is there a better way? Enter blanket. 
Uh, this is a project that I started a few months ago and something that I've been working heavily on. And the basic idea behind it is that we want to generate encryption completely randomly. We don't want to know our passwords. We don't want to know our keys. We want everything to be generated and destroyed immediately as it's used and the message sent on to the user. And it looks like this. So we import the module, we call blanket, and we encode our message with a cover. So just like a blanket, you want to cover your message nice and comfy, and the output is like this. So it's a bit bigger than a JSON web token. However, it is completely random. So let's take a look at the code. And here's the code itself. Um, we're importing base64 encoding. This is for minor details like the signature, but everything is also encrypted once we send the message. The top part here is the encryption part itself. This is using 256-bit encryption. We also generate random padding to fill the message to make sure that all of the bytes align and the message is able to be encrypted. The blanket class down below is where the actual encryption and structure of the data takes place. What we're doing is we're generating a signing key and also a verification key. Yeah. So now that it's a bit bigger, you can see here the code at the top. We need to generate the padding because our message is not necessarily always the exact same size. And when you're encrypting data, you need to make sure it has the correct amount of data, the correct amount of bytes, so that you can encrypt it correctly. And down below, here is where the real magic happens. This is the blanket class. And we're going to cover our payload by generating a signing key and a verification key. Now, these keys are never stored except in memory. They are immediately destroyed as soon as you send the message. We are generating a secret key simply out of random numbers. It's a quite long number, and this can also be generated in other ways. But the key point is that you need to generate your key randomly. Now we then take our message and we encrypt it with the 256-bit encryption. We verify it with the key. We sign it. And then we generate a separator. So with JSON Web Tokens, you have a period separating your header, which is the information about what kind of token it is, what encryption you're using, a period, and then the payload itself, a period, and then the signature. With Blanket, what we're doing is we're generating a random separator. Now, this could be better, but for the moment, it is a random three-digit number. Now, this changes with every single message that you send. And as you can see here, our message contains a separator at the very beginning, your key pass, which is the secret that you use to encrypt your message, the actual key itself, which is your public key, so that you can verify it, another separator, the signature, which is also encrypted, a separator, and then the actual message itself. Uh, down below, we have uncover. And the way this works is we're going to take a look at the first three digits or the first three characters of your message, which is the separator. Now, again, this can be better. There are other things we can add to the encryption, but it's at least a little bit more secure because everything is completely random. We're going to pull the separator out. And then from there, we can decrypt our message. So the separator is the first three characters. We then can find out the key pass. From the key pass, we can use that to decrypt the actual message itself and print out the message.
Okay, so the benefits. Our outputs are more randomized than JSON web tokens. And as you can see, this is the exact same payload, ran two times, and the message is completely different. Uh, the only way that you would be able to know that you're using blanket or how you would be able to decrypt this is by the first three digits. Anyone monitoring your traffic would not necessarily know what kind of encryption you're actually using. And it doesn't matter how many times you run this code, the message will always be different because the separator is random, your password is random, everything is random. You don't even know your own keys or password. The secret is generated and destroyed after use, completely random. Now there are problems though as well. As I already said, our separator could be more random. Now what we can do is, for instance, we're generating a three-digit number that we're using as our separator, but perhaps we can create a function that every time the separator is used, it adds or subtracts numbers as well. So this way the separator is completely different every time it's used. And on the decryption end, we would make sure that somehow embedded into the message, perhaps at the very end, we would have a code. For instance, a one-digit character, which would tell us that, um, say, two or three, and we would know that alternating the separator is adding two digits and removing two digits. And at the decryption end, we can decrypt this as well. One of the problems as well is that the message is much bigger. So you're using a data package at the bottom, this is JSON Web Tokens, and at the top is Blanket. So you're using quite a big data load for Blanket. The difference is, as you can see, you're providing your payload, but also your secret in JSON Web Tokens. And in Blanket, you are just providing your payload, nothing else. Everything else is completely random. And even with a generated secret, parts of the message structure remain the same. This is the period separating the header, the payload, and the signature itself. In a blanket, everything is completely random. Doesn't matter how many times you keep anything consistent, everything will always be different. Things we can improve on. We can randomize the size and location of the separator. Now, I already discussed this, but there are many different ways we can do it. Besides adding digits, we can perhaps add characters, and on the decryption end, we would make sure that we handle this. We can also use a hardware secret generator. For instance, if you're building an application for a phone, you may want them to have embedded chips or something like this. You can easily plug in a USB uh, dongle into your Android phone, which generates a key. Uh, this is a bit overload for most kind of data that you would want to send. For instance, most people are using WhatsApp. You wouldn't necessarily want to put a dongle into your phone, but for other applications, it's quite useful. And over time, our own sequence, even though random, could be discovered. So we should constantly try and improve our own code and think of ways that we can break this. And nothing is ever secure enough. When I was in London last month, I had a guy tell me that, why would you want to generate your random keys? Why would you want to generate a random password? There's a point where something is secure enough. And that's the exact moment that a hacker is going to come and steal all of your data. Because once you think something is secure enough, then you have stopped improving your security, and your encryption. And eventually, with enough time, with enough effort, someone is going to crack whatever you're doing and steal your data. So it's not a matter of spending money on encryption or spending money on security. It's more how much do you want to save if your data is actually stolen. So you may spend, say, thousands on a security application, but if your customer data with credit card data is leaked, then that could cost you millions or your entire company. Uh, for more information, at the very top, this is the GitHub for Python uh, implementation of JSON Web Tokens. 
and at the bottom is the blanket source code. Uh, this is um, kind of in its infancy, but I welcome any pull requests that you would like to send and hope that we can together generate a completely random encryption system. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk today. I hope you enjoyed it, and now, if you have any questions. With the, with the most upvotes was the following. Does your blanket message really contain its own encryption key? How is, how is that secure? Yes, it does include its own encryption key, and I will admit it's not very secure at the moment. Uh, the thing is that what I want to do with this project is try and create something completely random. Now, what you have to look at is, is it secure in the sense that it has the secret itself embedded, or would someone actually know that you are using Blanket? And that's what I'm trying to do with Blanket, is create such a message that you would not even know someone is actually using Blanket. Mm -hmm. And the next question is, you seem to be suggesting security by obscurity. Knowledge of encryption algorithm used should not cause problems. Any reaction to that? Um, well, I would say that the more we know about what someone is using and the more we know about what algorithm they're using, it's just more data for us as a hacker to know what you're doing and to be able to start decrypting. The more information we have on what you're doing and how you're doing it allows us to start the process, at least, of decrypting your data. Thank you. Another one, in the age of pervasive surveillance, what is your advice to users trying to protect their privacy from rogue law enforcement and security agencies? I would say trust no one. <laughs> and also, not even yourself. Uh, this is why I am really an advocate for completely random encryption and passwords and everything like this. Now, we can often be our own enemy by having the keys on us, by knowing our own password. For instance, um, if someone puts a gun to your head, you're going to give them the keys to your safe, you're going to give them the combination, or you're going to unlock your phone. Now, if there's no way for you to actually know your own password or to have the keys involved, then you can't decrypt this. Uh, one thing I would say for avoiding law enforcement, for instance, there are a lot of problems with people entering the US right now, and they're being asked to decrypt their phones, to unlock their laptops, and I would say simply fire up a VPS, virtual server, put all your data on there, encrypt it, and then travel through. When you get to the other side, decrypt your VPS and download all your data. Okay, uh, there's a related question. In the age of pervasive end-to-end uh, -end encryption, uh, what is your advice? Uh, just disappeared. Okay, anyway, um, let me see if it's, uh, it's been archived. Well, if I remember correctly, the question was mostly, you know, the other way around. Yeah. So, um, first one was, what, what is your advice to the users? And the other one is, what is your advice to the law enforcement agencies that need to fight criminals and, um, and terrorists? So, what is, any thoughts on that? Yeah, to law enforcement, I would say simply to try and learn more. Um, what you have a lot of times with law enforcement and government is there are quite a few steps behind. So what they should be doing is actually be hiring more hackers, learning more about encryption, and trying to do it themselves. Now you do have this with the CIA, NSA, but this is of course at the higher level. So if you, only if you're a terrorist or a government organization are they going to actually try and decrypt your data. For normal law enforcement, I would say to try and use the same tools that your enemy or the public is actually using and learn more about that. And uh, will that help? A follow-up question in, in, in their actual day-to-day -day activities? Like if we really achieve, you know, like perfect encryption, um, then, you know, what, is there, what are their options? Any, any thoughts on that? I think the goal, if we can achieve um, our goals is that once encryption 
is completely random, and we're able to make sure that no one else except who we exactly want to decrypt our message is able to decrypt it, then uh, there will be no hope for people like law enforcement. And this is good, but it's also bad. And I would simply say that there's always going to be evil, there's always going to be good, and whether or not you can decrypt someone's message is not going to stop the terrorism. It's not going to stop someone from doing what they're doing. You simply maybe have a one day, one hour, a one week heads up, but it's still going to happen. So it's not really going to change everything. I would say privacy is key. Next question. Uh, what stops rogue listener from using uh, uncover method to decrypt messages or decrypt the message? At the moment, nothing. Uh, this is why I welcome your pull request. As I said, the project is actually quite young, and this is one of the things that I'm working on. Um, there are ways, perhaps through IP logging. Of course, with IPs, you can fake these IPs, but there are many kinds of ways that we can try and make sure that only someone is decrypting the message who's meant to. Now, at the moment, anyone could use Uncover to take the blanket off and read your message, but this is part of the reason why I want to make sure everything is completely random. We want to hide as much as possible that someone is even using blanket. This question is kind of related, um, so I'm going to archive it for now. Uh, any plans for having a formal security audit of blanket? I would definitely welcome it. Um, that is one of the things that I'm working on is simply better encryption. Everything should be random. Nothing should be standardized, because once something is standardized, everyone knows how it works. OK. And um, are you rolling your own crypto, or are you internally using a recognized module like Python crypt cryptography module? Where, uh, where can, uh, can we find Blanket? You already posted the link. So uh, are you rolling your own crypto, or are you using a third-party library? At the moment, I'm using a crypto um, the module that's already out there. Yeah. OK. I think this is all the time we have for now. Thank you very much. And uh, if you have any more questions, please find Jeff and, uh, and ask him personally. Thank you, yeah, Jeff. Thank you very much.